Lord Jesus, we honor you today and we thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We thank you that you are our healer. We thank you, God, that you are mighty and great and greatly to be praised. We thank you for your word that gives us life. God, we thank you for your word that gives us direction and your spirit that helps guide us, Lord. We appreciate you and we thank you for all of your goodness to us, Lord. There is none greater than you, Jesus. And we pray for healing for each person, for hearts to be filled, for there to be encouragement, for there to be hope. God, we have hope in you. We don't have to worry. We have hope in you, Jesus. And we thank you for all that you've given us, Lord God. We thank you for that. And you are a good father. You are a good father. You love us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I have a savior, a friend forever. A lover of my soul. Through every trial, he won't forsake me. I'll never be alone. All I ever need is Jesus. All I want to sing is his name. All my heart belongs to Jesus, and by his grace and mercy I'm saved. There are no riches that could persuade me or steal away my soul. I have been ransomed now and forever, my Savior, my reward. All I ever need is Jesus. All I want to sing is his name. All my heart belongs to Jesus, by his grace and mercy I'm saved. All my heart belongs to Jesus, by his grace and mercy I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We appreciate you, Lord. You're so good. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said in John 5, 39, and I'm going to share this with all of you. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness of me. That was Jesus' words. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. By obeying the word of God, we experience abundant life. It is his promise to us. We ask who actually wrote the Bible. In 2 Peter 1 and 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And how is it possible for the Bible to be the word of God, even though it is written by men? In 1 Corinthians 2 and 13, and we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. We have to have a heart ready to receive the word of God and the spirit of the Lord gives us understanding, removes the blinders from our eyes and unstops our ears so that we won't hear a false teaching that would guide us in the wrong direction. In first Thessalonians two and 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but, but as what it really is the word of God, which is at work in believers. Galatians 1 says, 
in 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Why is the Bible the only book needed to know God's will? In 2 Samuel 22 and 31, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. In Proverbs 30, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And that's verse five. In Psalms 19, seven through eight, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. In Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. In 8 and 20, to the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. In Psalms 111, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. In 1 Thessalonians 2, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in the believers. What does the Bible say about those who do not follow its teachings? In Proverbs 13, whoever despises the word, brings destruction upon himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. In Matthew 15, he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? In 2 Timothy 4 and 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, we see that a lot today. There's encouraging words out there. There's every kind of, you're doing all right. And maybe so, but what if you're not? And we have to have truth with that grace, with that kind word. There has to come truth or it's nothing but a lie. In Isaiah 8 and 20, to the teaching and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. In Mark 7 and 9, he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. In Jeremiah 23, 36, but the burden of the Lord, you shall mention no more for the burden is every man's own word. And you pervert the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. In 2 Timothy 3 and 8, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. What does the Bible say about adding to or taking away from the word of God? In Deuteronomy 4 and 2, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. In 2 Corinthians 2, 17, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, 
as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. In Proverbs 30, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. In 1 Timothy 6 and 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. And finally, what is the penalty for adding to or taking away from God's word as it is revealed in the Bible? Galatians 1 and 8, but if, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let them be accursed. In Revelations 22, 19, and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And I want to bring to y'all a little bit about Isaiah. Um, part of what um, we did yesterday was to read the first uh, chapter, or excuse me, yes, the first chapter. But um, we, I am just going to bring you a breakdown of Isaiah, because I believe it's something that uh, due to its length and um, a lot of uh, details and things that you can take the time on your own to read. Um, but I do have some comments and things that help us to understand Isaiah. And I think it's important that we rightly divide the word of truth, as the word says for us to, to be workers, to show approval by us looking into the word for ourselves. And the division of it is helpful to understand what certain things mean. And as you study, you begin to hear that and see that for yourself. Um, Isaiah is one of the largest and most complicated books in the whole Bible, similar to Judges. You can read it and feel very depressed, or you can feel excited or elated. Jesus opened the book of Isaiah in the synagogue and read from it. Isaiah is the book that the New Testament quotes the most. There are so many prophecies in there. It has a record of preaching. It has a record of oracles, stories, prophecies, condemnation, and comfort. It's helpful to know what you're reading when you're in it. So from chapter 1 to 39... That's all judgment. It's as you're reading it, you'll notice that there's a lot of word to Israel about them not obeying God and uh, not following the things that they should follow and not honoring the things of God and bringing shame to the things of God. As we read in chapter one yesterday, that gives you a synopsis of what you would read in those next 39 books, because it is a continuation of Isaiah receiving a word from God about his disapproval of the things that they have done, the way that they've handled things, the way that they, you know, have in chapters one through four, it's talking all about their failure and God saying things like new moons and your feasts, my soul hate, and they are burdened. They are a burden that is wearing on me. And in chapter five, it's a vivid picture of a vineyard, which represents Israel and the vine dresser, which represents God. It's just another picture of the devastation of the broken covenants. And six is one where Isaiah is gets a vision and he is actually in the throne room of God. And God puts uh, a coal from the fire up on his tongue to burn the iniquity. He also sees a vision of six wing angel that is part of the action of that purification. And he sent on a mission to God to preach revival to the people of Israel. And his obedience to that command is that book that we're reading in Isaiah. Also in chapters 40 through 66, those are all about redemption. And we do know that that is the promise that God has for us. As you continue studying through 7 and 12, there's narratives within them that, that show different type of situations that still fall within those judgments. Um, 
there's a king of Judah that's under attack by a nation. And Isaiah brings them a sign. The first king, King Ahaz, rejects the sign, but God still gives it to him. The sign's clear picture of the Messiah, who we now know is Jesus Christ. He's described as Emmanuel. He talks about his nature in chapter 11. He talks how Jesus is messianic branch from the line of David. Um, some of the most iconic verses in the whole Testament are here that talks about the virgin will conceive and call his name Emmanuel. And we know that means God with us. And that was Jesus. That was who we had on earth in flesh that took on that robe. In chapter nine, it says that his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we think about that. His name is Jesus. It also indicates that he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He, he is God all in one. In all of these areas, flesh that came to die on the cross, the spirit that is able to fill us, the spirit that is about all of the earth, that is all over in every area of the universe. He is in all places at all times. It is with righteousness that he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meat of the earth. Jesus moments everywhere in the book, all through. It's like I was saying yesterday when we read chapter one, it's not often given as a prophecy of, of Christ. But when we understand that Christ, Jesus Christ is God, he is all, all encompassing. Then we understand that what he was saying was directly about the coming of Christ and how he would be rejected and all of those things. And then of course, there's more even specific, as I just read, that he would be born of a virgin. And this is something that was written early in uh, BCs before there would have ever been known this thing. And, and it came to pass. There's so many prophecies that have come to pass. In the oracles and the judgments, there's a lot of that that continues. It talks about the nations of Babylon, which include Moab, which we talked about with Ruth cursed nations, um, Felicia, Cush, Egypt, um, over and over about Babylon because of, of their, you know, uh, time that they spent in holding Israel captive. Um, in Moab, you know, the descendants of Lot, that that was such a cursed group. Egypt, that possible, the people, obviously Moses led them from Eden, the descendants of Esau, so on and so forth. It goes through all of that in there. There are chapters 24 through 27 describes God's judgments. The focus zooms in on, uh, again, back to chapter one, it repeats those same, in, that same information and that same judgment. And as we continue on and we get to the chapters in 44, um, 40 and four through 48, there talks about the deliverance from Babylon a little over a hundred years after Isaiah wrote this Judah would be in captivity to the Babylonian people. Isaiah prophesied this and also about their safe return back to Israel, which happens piece by piece. Some that was written down in Ezra and Nehemiah and then through 49 through 57, redemption from sin much more than temporal salvation from a temporary overlord in like what we were talking about people were bringing the animals to get freed from their sin and it was a temporary thing that they would go and it was like i don't know if they ran out of animals because from what i understand it was a regular situation but god says through Isaiah, I will keep you and give you as a covenant people. A nursing mother can forget her nursing child 
even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. And you, the ransom of the Lord, shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon your head. These are some of the most beautiful verses and redemptive verses and Jesus moments. In 53, it's the, there's so much in Isaiah 53 about Jesus. Jewish friends will even say to you that they understand that there's some real relevance, but they don't sometimes want to admit. It talks about him being crucified and this was written 700 years before the Messiah was even born. And that brings us through all of Isaiah into 66, where every bit of that is speaks of the, the seed that would be planted and that the sower would receive a fruit from the ground. They would reap what they sow that the there would be bread and there would be rivers of living water and these are things that isaiah has brought as a prophecy as a promise from god it was such a beautiful time for us to understand that and then as we read about the things in matthew and how jesus revealed so much of that um in his words to us and his promises and what he did and as we continue through, I just want to say, Lord, thank you for your word again. Thank you for helping us to see your kindness and your goodness to us, Lord, helping us to understand that you are the word, that your word is true, and that every promise in the book is ours. And we receive that, Lord, in Jesus' name.